All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right, we're going to talk more maintenance stuff. We ended with talking about uh, cleaning out the bottom of the condenser. And so now we're getting into washing the condenser coil. And this is one of these, um, this is one of these topics that it's, it's almost like you contradict yourself uh, when you teach it because I, I'm a really big advocate for washing condenser coils. They do need to be washed. It's one of the things that's on the list. It's a very important step. But we absolutely do not want to make anything worse by washing a condenser coil. So you have a brand new system that's six months old. You're probably just going to rinse the thing, right? It's not like it, you don't, or, or a year old. You, you, you don't want to add cleaners to it. Um, but the philosophy is still clean it till it's clean. So when we talk about drains, I was actually just re-listening to Bert and I's podcast. I know that sounds weird, um, but I, I hadn't actually listened to it before. And uh, that was one of the things that we talked about a lot there is, you know, cleaning a, uh, a drain line, clean it until you can physically see that the pan is clean, that you can look down the T and you can see it's clean. And the same thing is true of your condenser coil. There are some cases. So, like, you'll have... Um, uh, train spine fin coils uh, where you'll get like pine needles in them or you'll get you know lint in them and it's like almost impossible to get out in some cases and so there are some cases where you're not going to physically get every single piece of everything out I mean the only way to do it would be like tweezers you know one at a time um, which is why our, our standard procedure would be pull the top tops already off you're rinsing it from the inside out, and you're using properly diluted cleaners when it requires properly diluted cleaners. And when is that? Well, it's when you can see that there's uh, enough soil that that makes sense. I'm going to kind of turn that over to Bert quickly. What would you What would you add to that, Bert, as far as when it's appropriate to use more than water? Um, you can usually tell that when something is loosely on there, like if you blew against it or it's not growing, it doesn't have mildew on it, it doesn't have... It's not crusty and hard like it's caked on. Then you know you can just rinse it right out. Whereas if it looks like it's been there a while, um, it's caked on, uh, then let's use water or a cleaner. The other the other thing would be that if you use water and you don't see that you're getting it clean, then you know okay I need to slow down here, start over, let's put some cleaner, let it sit for a little bit. I'll go do something else while the cleaner sits for a bit. Come back to this. And again, we talk about uh, washing it from the inside out. Um, that's a good best practice. But you also know, those of you who are obsessed with cleaning things, which uh, I certainly am, that that's not all you do. It's not like you just go from the inside out and then you're done, right? You go from the inside out, you do the outside. And if you have even cases where, um, say, there is a dryer vent that's a little too close or you have, somebody has a dog that lays up next to the condenser or whatever, like my stupid dog does, it gets so dirty, um, you should really almost pull the entire uh, outside casing off with some brands. Some brands, you really just can't get to it, um, and that is just something we should do. And, yes, it will probably take an extra 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. That's okay. Not every maintenance should take exactly the same amount of time. In fact, if every maintenance takes exactly the same amount of time, then you're probably not doing a really thorough maintenance. You're going to have some that's, like, super clean. You get in and out in 45 minutes in some cases, right? You just super basic. And you're going to have some that you're going to be there an hour and a half. And that's because it's really dirty and it needs to be cleaned. Uh, and here, at least, we, we're never going to hassle you for taking the time to do a maintenance well. Now, if every single maintenance is taking you 90, 100 minutes, well, okay, you know, like, let's look at why that's happening. But some of them are going to take that long. And this is one of the examples. If you've got a you know, you got an old train or something, and uh, you're just not able to kind of wash it from both sides. You have to pull that whole thing off. The same thing is true with splitting coils, okay? This is something that you've probably, most of you have probably never done, but it's something you really need to be aware of. If you have multi-row condensers, and there's a lot of them out there where you look and there's actually two condensers, one inside the other, if it's been really dirty, so you have one of those cases where there's a dryer vent or it's a dog or it's a whatever, it's just really filthy, you'll get stuff that builds up in between those two coils because the fins don't line up exactly. And if you just wash, you're just going to pack. What's, what you wash in this direction is just going to pack in that gap. And if you wash the other direction, it's going to pack the other side. 
um, you have to actually split them, which is just, uh, it's, I'm not even going to go into what you have to do necessarily, but you have to like cut the, the end tube, like usually they'll have something that connects the end tubes. You're definitely going to have to take everything apart and you just kind of peel them apart a little bit so you can get a gap and kind of wash everything out of that gap. In commercial, that is very important. You'll run into some cases where you're running high head pressure and it doesn't make any sense. And sure enough, you'll pay attention and you'll see that it's a, that it's a multi-row condenser. Now, obviously, that is not something that you do every time. And, and again, this is where people get super dogmatic. It's like, if it's a split condenser, you need to do it every single time. It's like, yeah, if you do that every time you do a maintenance, eventually you're going to cause a leak or something by the time you're, you know, you're moving that thing around all the time. But clean it till it's clean is the main philosophy and always clean it. If you're there for a maintenance, and again, it depends on, like, because there are some commercial contracts where you do only wash it uh, in one season and not the other season. Um, but do clean it. If, if it says that you're supposed to clean it this time, then clean it. Uh, and the simplest way would just be to use water. Um, I'm not a fan, actually, of this picture where we're just using the end of a hose. Um, and the reason just is, is that there's certain things that are difficult, like, like when you're using a proper hose nozzle, it's easier to kind of get down, you know, down in, whereas here, if you're kind of blocking off your thumb and you're inconsistent with your flow. So I'm not a super big fan of that. I don't know whose hand that is. That's a proper nozzle. Um, oh, it is a proper nozzle. It's one of those little uh, oh. line nozzles, I think. Oh, fine. All right. Well, you know, I'm sorry that I wrongly accused whoever's hand that is. And here it mentions, you know, if you do have to split a condenser, that would, that would be something we would probably charge more for. It doesn't happen very often, but I want you to be aware of it. Because now that you are aware of it, especially if you see a system that's running high head and it doesn't make any sense, pay attention for that. Jacob. Splitting the answer, aren't they normally capped on both ends of the capillary tubes with a metal sheet metal? Do you have to pop that off to split the apart? It's, uh, it depends on the brand. Um, and again, it's been a really long time since I've done one in residential, so you're just going to have to look at the individual. In some cases, you may not be able to do it. In some cases, it may not be possible. For sure, you're going to have to pull the entire cage off, though, before you can even see what has to happen. Usually, usually one end, obviously, is all connected with the capillary tubes and everything, and the other end is free, but usually there's some sort of, there's something that's holding it together on that end, and you just have to get that separated, and then you can kind of get it peeled apart a little bit. But, but at the end that it's connected, it, you're still not going to get... So you're kind of just taking... You're taking the end that it's connected, and you're just separating it a little bit and, and uh, kind of working your way down. It's still not going to be easy. There's a little metal clip in between the, the two um, sides that's holding it together, so you can pop it off with like a screwdriver or something if you really go at it. Yeah, we were destroying them at the junkyard. We came across those all the time, and they were fun to... Uh, all right, additional condensing unit checks. Um, I would actually like to turn this over to you guys. So what are some things that you're watching for? I mean, we got this list here, and it's very small letters, so I'm going to make you strain your eyes. But what are some things that you're looking for when you're inside that condenser? When you've washed it, you've cleaned out the bottom, what are some other things you're looking for? Rust and quiet rub. Rust, it, rust right, corrosion. Rub out, like, wires rubbing. Yes, wires rubbing out. That's, you know that that's the thing I love to talk about. I always get flack for using that particular term. But... Um, but yeah, anything that's anything that's going to cause abrasion <laughs> inside the condenser, whether it's tube on tube or wire on tube, what else? Deteriorating coils. What's that? Deteriorating coils. Deteriorating coils is a big one. And actually, you see this a lot um, in cases where you've had people misusing cleaners. The one thing, and, and so I'm not going to give this whole speech again. Um, anybody remember that? Um, so... <laughs> abusing coil, abusing cleaners uh, by using them too concentrated or using them outside of their design is absolutely something you just have to go away from. And when coils deteriorate abnormally, it's usually because somebody was consistently using over-concentrated. Um, a lot of people don't realize this. Like brown, clean, the, the brown cleaners, um, like Triple D, typically the brown ones um, are alkaline. Uh, and some of them are highly alkaline. And whether something is highly alkaline or whether it's highly acidic, in both cases, it's going to cause corrosion and deterioration, but for different materials more than others, right? So when you feel that, when you get the brown cleaner on you fully concentrated and you feel that slippery, it's not actually an acid. It's just highly alkaline. And that's actually the reason. So when we, I didn't actually know what it was. Um, so when you got it in your eyes, thank God, it's just highly alkaline. It's not acidic. If it was actually an acid, uh, you know, heaven help us. It would have been a lot worse than it was. Um, and so we've really gone away from acidic cleaners, but there are still some out there. 
Um, New Calgon makes some, uh, and it's it's this pink stuff, or the bright blue stuff sometimes, the really bright blue the stuff. That's what burns. And that is an acid. Um, those we just don't use, and there's just no reason to mess with it. It's just too risky. It's not because it doesn't work if properly applied. It's just because all it takes is a little mistake, and, uh, and we've got a major issue. What are some other things you guys pay attention for? The line dryers, they tend to rust out a lot of time. Line dryers are a big one. Um, there's only a couple brands that have line dryers, or at least typical types of line dryers, inside the condensing unit. Lennox and Goodman, Goodman is one. <laughs> uh, Lennox can have one, yes, the heat mode one uh, inside. What's that? Mufflers. Mufflers are another big one, and a lot of times mufflers look exactly like liquid line dryers, but how can you tell the difference? <laughs> they cause a restriction. <laughs> a, mu mufflers in, a mufflers in the discharge line, right? But. And in many cases, and you'll actually find these in some older units, you'll look at a muffler and it'll actually say liquid line dryer on it. It's actually literally a liquid line dryer shell that has no insides and it makes it a muffler. Just gives it room for the gases to expand and contract. If there's one inside, making sure there's also not one outside, you'll see. Correct. Yeah, duplicate line dryers. That's actually a really good point. So if you're there doing a maintenance, look for duplicate line dryers. What should you do if you find duplicate liquid line dryers when you're there for a maintenance? You should quote to remove it. At that point, the clients very well might decline it because it's not gonna be cheap to do, but what did we do? We let them know, right? We let them know, hey, there really shouldn't be two of these. Now, can you check to see if it is a problem? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, you just check for temperature drop. Now, does that confirm 100% that there's no problem? Uh -uh. No, it does not, and we proved that in the symposium. We did this whole thing here where we proved <laughs> that you can have a restriction in your liquid line and not have a temperature difference. So that's why we quoted anyway. It's not gonna be a major problem in almost every case if there isn't a temperature drop, but you can't prove that it's not slightly restricted and impacting the operation of the system. So it's something that we should quote to cut out. Does everybody understand that, what I'm saying there? More than one liquid line dryer. Or a suction. Well, yeah, a suction dryer being in place is that that one gets uh, trickier. Now, with suction dryer being in place, how can you confirm if a suction dryer that was left in is a problem or not? Depending on what kind it is, you can check across it, or if it has the ports, check for a pressure drop across. Almost every suction dryer uh, has pressure ports. Not all of them have them on both sides, but you have one on the other side that, if it was installed in the right direction, that you can already check. What are you doing this for? What about bike lighters? If it was, well, obviously. Yeah. If it wasn't installed in the right direction, then you if definitely left should. Off, I'm assuming it wasn't installed in the right direction. Yeah, right, and there's no such thing as a biflow suction dryer, right? So, um, there is a biflow suction dryer? We have nine of them in the shop right now. <laughs> Don't get one. Why would you want a biflow suction dryer? I have no idea. So that way you don't see. We're having this conversation. You take out the sure yeah. application where there would be suction going in two different directions. I don't, I don't know. You wouldn't want discharge flying through that. Yeah, that's, but, but these are all really good points. And again, like for those of you who get bored by maintenance, anybody here ever get bored by maintenance? Of course not. I definitely do. Never. Um, you never do. Okay, well, good for you. I'm proud of you. Uh, but if you ever find yourself getting bored, uh, make it a challenge to find real things with the equipment. Um, and again, we're not talking about like, you know, a lot of people are like, well, you know, sell up. I'm not talking about selling upgrades. I'm saying finding real things that you can prevent with the equipment. And look, wires rubbing out is a big one. Tube on tube, that's a big one. What are some things you can do in those cases when wires are rubbing out or tube on tube? What are some things you can do to prevent it? Uh, um, zip, 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 ties. zip ties and insulation, like they put foam insulation around whatever line it's rubbing on and then zip tie it. Zip tie. That's a good one, that's a good one. Foam insulation though, keep in mind, depending on what it is, um, can deteriorate over time. If it's exposed to sunlight, that kind of thing. So think about that. Um, a lot of times that, that like white insulation, that's uh, the, the more foamy stuff, if you have any of that, that's handy. The, the we use on, um, all of a sudden I'm forgetting the name of the actual product, the ductless line sets. Of course, that also may cause it to corrode, so that's a whole other question. Um, but another one is seal tight. You can actually take seal tight, um, and if you can get the end off, you can actually route it through seal tight. Like if it's compressor wires, you can, you know what I'm talking about by seal tight. Carflex, the, yeah, the stuff we use for whips. Um, if you just take a piece of that, you can unhook and then route it through in some cases, or you can slit it. Now, again, when you're slitting it, that stuff's pretty thick, so just be really careful not to cut yourself um, when you're slitting it with a razor knife. But then you can wrap that around. That works pretty good. Um, in some cases, you don't really need anything. You just, if you zip tie it together properly, then it won't be touching anymore, you know? So there's a lot of different strategies you can use. Um, if it has a crankcase heater in the system, pay close attention to that. Crankcase heaters 
often fail. Um, those wires can often become, um, they, can, they can rub out in different places. Uh, always make sure to check all of your connections. One of the really best things to do is just kind of move stuff around. You know, when you're, when you're looking uh, inside the quarter panel on a condenser, um, just kind of moving the wires around, just feeling them, making sure nothing's loose, that, that alone is really handy. On capacitors over time, especially your, if you're testing the capacitors not under load, make sure that when you put them back on, every spade is super snug. And we're talking about, you know, a second of just test, 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 move stuff around, make sure nothing's loose, that kind of thing. Um, same thing is true. I, I, I do also like... Um, where possible for you to inspect compressor terminals. I do not want you pulling plugs off though, okay? So this is a key distinction. Um, when you pull a plug off, especially if you kind of pitch it, you're putting stress on those compressor terminals. And have you ever heard guys say like, man, I had a, I had a compressor blow out a terminal right when I was there. I was there troubleshooting it and it blew a terminal off right in my face. Um, that happens because something in the process of taking that plug off weakened one of those terminals. Keep in mind, those terminals, they're just pieces of metal um, that go through glass, fusite. It's a type of glass, and, and that is a fairly fragile um, substance, and so you can crack it, and that will cause that problem. So be careful whenever you're doing that. But, but if it's regular terminals and it just has a cover, I would say pop that cover off. Now, some of you are like, that's crazy. Those covers are really hard to get off. Yeah, but that's also kind of a, like, if, once you get good at it, uh, you can get those covers off pretty easy. Um, and so it's, you know, it's a, it's a skill to master. Um, would you agree with that, Bert? You know, once you get good at it, you can get it off really easy. Hmm. Yeah. And you'll see a lot of them. You just repeated what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> you asked if I agree. Oh, okay. good. That is good. You do. Um, but more and more, it's plugs, to Bert's point, and I don't want you pulling plugs off because you're likely to... Do you understand why? why? What the difference that I'm saying there? When you're pulling the plug off, you're actually directly putting force on the terminals. If you're pulling a cap off, you're not putting force on anything. You're just taking a cap off and you're looking. So there's a big difference there. Again, in maintenance, the number one rule is do no harm. We don't want to break anything in the process. Um, so anything that requires a lot of force or whatever, you know, we, we have to be really careful with that. Yeah, checking, all the, checking for rust, corrosion, all that stuff. Accumulators, if there's any accumulator in place, we want to try to uh, get down and look at the bottom of it. That's where an inspection mirror comes in really handy. For those of you, again, and I said this last time, for those of you who have gone away from mirrors and flashlights, I would encourage you to, to rethink that. A phone is a really nice thing, and you can get pictures of things in a lot of cases, but there are some things that's just really hard to see unless you have an inspection mirror, uh, especially for things like brazing. Like, you don't want to be using your phone for that. Uh, you, you, you'll eventually damage, you'll do something dumb and damage your phone. So I would, I would definitely suggest having inspection mirrors, having a um, flashlight, and for things like getting down underneath and looking at the bottom of, the, of an accumulator is another good example of that. Observe for oil spotting. This is really big. Like, um, it, you'll catch a lot of things by just paying attention and looking for oil. Even cases like with evaporator coils, a lot of times you'll find like a, a residue um, that will indicate an evaporator coil leak. But especially with microchannel condensers, does ever, anybody know what a, anybody, okay, go ahead. Describe a microchannel condenser. How, do, how can you tell the difference? I mean, it's just a set of the fins because the fins aren't pushing outwards. They're going up in between. You can actually see the tubes a little bit more. Yeah. So when you look at a microchannel coil, you're actually seeing, like you see this flat surface and you see these little triangles, little triangles in between, right? That, that little edge that you see has refrigerant flowing right at the edge. There's these little tiny tubes that go in there. And so any little ding, any little, any little um, damage can cause a leak. But the thing is, when, it, when you do that, it's a tiny leak. Normally, in a, in a regular condenser coil, fin and tube condenser, if you are leaking, you're going to know it, and you're going to be flat like that, right? But in a microchannel condenser, you're still, the leaks are still gonna, can be pretty small, even though it's high pressure, even though it's liquid, because it's just a tiny little channel. So, and those can be repaired, actually, if you, if you didn't know that. You can, you can repair those, and, and they're actually fairly easy because the leak is always on the surface. Now, it's ugly, when you're done with it. But that's where you can use um, alloy saw from solder weld, the stuff that we use, and it's actually pretty easy to do. So just a quick tip there. But you will see oil spotting if you do have one that's, uh, that's leaking in that way. And I've actually found that a couple times. Um, when you are, we talked about this before, but when you are replacing the top, you, you take it really, really seriously. Take that action very seriously. Where the wires are routed, how they're routed into the top. And it's one of those things that 
um, with the first times you do it, it feels impossible. It's like, how do I get all of these? You just get good with it over time, and it only practice will make it make you good at it. Go ahead. Can I say that number 11 should be done before number 10? Because you want to spot for oil before you start cleaning the coil and wash it off? You can say that. OK. Um, you're completely wrong. I'm kidding. I don't. Yes, you're right. Obviously, yes, you should check for the oil spotting beforehand. Rewire everything. Make sure that. And again, if you're if you're inexperienced with uh, wiring, where you don't know where every wire goes, just take pictures. Pictures are the best way to go. Um, and don't use, you know, don't use the excuse of, well, I'm not gonna. Again, this I'm, I'm going to talk about pulling tops again. Um, are there times when you don't have to pull tops? Sure, but in general, when maintenance, I like you pulling tops. Don't use the excuse of, well, but I might miswire it. Well, just take a picture and then don't miswire it, right? Or I might pinch the wire. Well, just don't pinch the wire, right? Get good at, I, I, no, I'm, I'm like, I'm not kidding. This is what happens in a lot of cases. And I understand it because you're new. When you're brand new, everybody's trying to protect you from yourself. But that's not how you want to be, right? Like, you don't want to be afraid of the machine that, you're, that you professionally work on every day. You just need to know how to do it. And sometimes they are very challenging. You get on some of those brands, and it's like, oh, geez, this is going to be a pain in the butt, right? And again, when I'm talking, remember, I'm talking like 15 years ago, so everything I'm saying, you're probably like, this guy's an idiot. That's not true. Like, yes, I, the equipment is different than it was when I was doing it, for sure. Check contactor points, really big. Um, and this is something that you can easily overdo or underdo. So you can easily start to become that guy who's like every contactor is pitted, right? And that's not what we do. You can tell the difference between a contactor where it's just the contact points look a little rough. They all do, almost universally, look a little rough um, after they've run for a couple years. That's not what we're saying. It's when you can see that the heat that's been caused is starting to extend, right? Like, like you can see that it's starting to damage the actual contacts. And when they get to that point, it is a good idea to quote a replacement. Um, do we see a lot of systems fail because of contactor failure? Do you have a lot of cases where systems fail because of contactor failure? It's a trick question because, yes, for a while we did see that a lot, and maybe we still are, but that was the coil shorting out, not the same thing as issues with the high-voltage contacts. And again, that's not what we're looking for anyway, so we can't really prevent that other than just replacing those crap contactors when we see them. Um, the points, the actual contacts failing, does happen on occasion, but it's not that common of a problem. We don't want to overstate that to clients because then we become parts changers. But we do need to look at it because there are cases where they could be adding resistance uh, and that affects the operation of the system, but not necessarily to failure, right? If the contacts are adding resistance, it can cause, um, it, it can cause the motors to run hotter. You know, it causes a voltage drop, so it's not a good thing. You can also cause an arc spark in the contact and let the contact melt. I've seen that with the actual. Yeah, sure, right, it can. It can melt, and that's what I was saying. But, but very rarely, how many service calls are you going out and it's like, oh, it's the contactor failed? Again, trick question. Coil, yes. Contacts themselves, the part that we can look at, not, not necessarily. Anything to add there, Bert or Dre? When, they, when it is a problem, it's really big. When it's a problem, you could have potentially some systems, you'll be stuck running in heat because the contactor is stuck in. Uh, or you will have a failed compressor as a result. So right. it's a when it's starting to get bad, it has the potential to be a monster problem, which is why we quote, quote it. All right, we move inside. Um, again, be very observant. Don't say, okay, the supply duct looks like, you know, looks terrible but that's not part of a maintenance, so I'm not gonna say anything. Or it looks terrible and I don't say anything because it's gonna be a giant pain to have to deal with this with the client, right? What, what should we do, for example, if a system that we installed and the supply duct looks like garbage? We should have it taken care of, right? And, and again, if you're qualified to take care of it and you got time to take care of it, you take care of it. If not, we get it scheduled and we get it taken care of. That's what we do. We don't ever workmanship, we warranty forever. If it was a workmanship problem, it's something we did that we should have done differently, then we always take care of it. Which means that if you go back on any jobs of any systems that I installed uh, 15 years ago, we should probably just reinstall it because the workmanship is probably horrible. Um, so yeah, we, we should always take care of anything that anything that um, like that. But if it's something we didn't install, and you see that it's you know it's got all kinds of growth on it, looks really bad. Um, what are some of the ways that you can confirm the actual cause, though? What could you do to confirm why it looks the way it does? 
cut a hole in the duct on the right side. You could cut a hole in the duct. Um, the easier way would be to look from the inside. And that would generally be pulling the blower or pulling the heat strip kit. Um, depends on the unit, which one's going to be easier to do. Um, but getting up in there and actually looking, like, is this, you know, are there big gaps on the inside here? Um, because in some cases, it's actually the conditions that the unit is placed in. If you've, ever, if you've ever worked on an air handler that's in a garage, but in an enclosed closet in a garage, have you ever seen one like this? Mm -hmm. Have you ever noticed how much of a cesspool it is inside a lot of those? Um, and the reason is, is because there's no dehumidification in there, but it also is able to kind of cool everything radiantly. So because the cabinet, obviously, of an air handler, it's insulated, but it's not perfectly insulated. So it actually does kind of cool the area around it. When it's in a big room, a big garage, there's still airflow, uh, and it's not, like, close to everything. Inside of an enclosed closet, it just starts to cool everything in that closet, and everything in that closet starts to condensate. And so sometimes those problems with growth aren't necessarily because the ducts were improperly installed. That's the point that I'm making. So you do have to kind of observe. And if you're going to tell somebody, for example, that an entire four piece needs to be replaced, you need to look at it from the inside to set, I mean, sometimes you can tell from the outside. Sometimes you can just see touch it. it sometimes yeah. You, know, sometimes yeah, you can just feel it bouncing and all that. But, but if you're not sure, look at it from the inside because that's when you can see, are there a bunch of gaps? Um, that, you know, is this thing irreconcilably bad? Because in some cases, if it's not too bad, you can actually seal it from the inside uh, and prevent some of those problems. Um, and that's a much less expensive, much easier fix. How do you feel about sealing things from the inside, Bert? I'm fine with it, as long as it's not really extreme. You can't use mastic as insulation, so. Right, mastic does not insulate. It's going to seal, but not insulate. One of the things that we don't do that we really should be doing, and like, I feel okay about it because nobody does it, is having starter collars on air handlers. So like, you know how we just kind of like take duckboard and just sort of like set it there, and then we just sort of like seal it? That's actually not the right way, and it isn't even actually code. Code is that we have to mechanically fasten the ductwork to the air handler. Did you know that? No. Fun fact. Um, so the right way to do that would be to have um, a starter collar, which would be like a piece of metal that goes around and, you know, just has like a flange. And you see, you know, like some of these air handlers have these tiny little dopey flanges you couldn't do anything with. Um, but you could attach to that or attach to the unit and bring it up. And then you would attach your ductwork to that. And then you would screw through with like washers or something so that it actually like attached physically. Now, again, that's not the attachment part's not the big deal because we don't have... Uh, four pieces or plenums falling off of units all the time, at least not in uh, vertical applications. But a lot of the reason why we get these problems that we have, this is a long explanation to say, is because we actually have air leaks. Like we have gaps. It's not an insulation problem, it's a gaps problem. And so that's one of the ways that we could potentially really solve it is having this kind of blocking that gap where it hits the unit and interfaces with the unit. So anyway, that's just a, hey, you guys, if you ever want to mess with that, that would be a fun thing to do. Um, and literally, it would just be a piece of sheet metal. It would just be part of the process. You would, you would cut and bend a piece of sheet metal and, and flange it up and attach it to the unit before you put your four-piece on. Anyway, manufacturers supposedly make these things, and I've never seen them. They're like this, they're like the Yeti. You know, we're told it exists, but we, but we never see it for fan coils. Let's just finish here. Um, when you talk about uh, cleaning evaporator coils, I do not want us to be bashful when it comes to cleaning things we can clean. I don't like us making excuses for like, oh, you got to pull and clean it. If it's literally just surface soil, in a lot of cases, we can get it off. Sometimes we can't. Sometimes we can't. But sometimes we can, especially when there's direct returns and things like that. Um, and if you can, because a lot of times if you've ever cleaned a coil where it's like animal hair or whatever, you can just literally like peel it off. You know, like you can just kind of get it started and get it rolling off and, and get that off. And again, we just don't want to be babies about cleaning. We want to be... If we can clean it, we're going to clean it. And if it's reasonable for us to clean, we're going to clean it. Pulling and cleaning an evaporator coil is a pretty invasive procedure. And if it's an older system, we really don't want to do it anyway. Like if it's a 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 year old system with the way that evaporator coils leak, you, by the time you pull that thing out and wash it with cleaner and put it back in, it's probably leaking, right? So you want to be kind of like act in, the, act in the client's best interest. Again, remember, they're paying us. They trust us. One of the main things that they trust us to do is clean the unit. If it's an A-coil and as you really can't get to the underside of it, there's no way to get that, you know, to get that 
triangle piece off, there's just nothing you can do, well then there's nothing you can do. But if you can clean it, clean it to the best of your ability. Um, we'll talk about drains uh, next week. Obviously drains are drains, we talk about it all the time, but obviously it's a huge part of a maintenance. Um, anything, anything anyone wants to add as it relates to any of the stuff we've talked about or specifically cleaning evaporators? Specifically cleaning evaporators, um, if you find something that you can quickly do on a maintenance, that's a part of the maintenance. Uh, when it becomes a project, then it needs to be quoted uh, and take the time that you need there. Don't rush through a cleaning. If you do a half cleaning, you can make the problem worse. You can lodge stuff into the coil and then it hardens and you leave and it's worse than when you got there. Right. Um, so, and then the other thing is, is that if they have a cleaning uh, that needs to be done, there's a problem that's deeper that needs to be addressed. We have a filtration issue with our system. So we need to upgrade their filter system, however, whatever that looks like. Um, ideally, like in the application you see right here, we could put a media filter. There's an overhead coming down. Yep, overhead return right there. Yeah. And we could install a media filter, so use this opportunity not just to you know, dampen the immediate system, but let's take care of the root issue as well. Right. And that requires client conversations, right? You know, hey, here's what, here's, we're in this position, your evaporator cool is dirty, there's a lot of reasons that can happen, and clients will often, it's just like, just like when you go to the dentist and you have cavities, right, like you're never happy about that, and, and the dentist berating you about the fact that you don't brush and floss properly doesn't help. I mean, you can bring it, they can bring it up, but like, and the client's gonna be like, I change my filter every month, I don't know why that's happening. Well, we're, you know, it could be filter quality challenge, it could be filter bypass, you know, sometimes, you know, if it's not in exactly right, air can get around and that can cause it. There's a lot of different factors. There's no need to berate the client, but media filters solve this problem. You know, they do if they're installed properly and you use the right filter. So, um, yeah, all, all those are very, very good points. We want to solve the root problem with the client as much as possible. But again, what I'm saying is, um, it can become, we do not want to be a company that does one of two things or, or an individual. You don't want to be a giant show off where you're throwing everybody else under the bus who's ever done a maintenance on that unit. That's not helpful, right? Do a good job, but don't do the whole like, because you, you run into this. What clients will say is, nobody else has ever done that, right? And then how you handle that tells you a lot about yourself, yep. right? If you're the person who says, you know, it's hard to say, you know, maybe, you know, maybe you just never noticed it before. It is, it's part of the list. Or you could say something like, yeah, it's actually not part of the list, but it's just something a little extra that I noticed that I'm taking care of for you. That's one way of handling it. Or the other way is, well, I don't know, ma'am, why nobody's ever done this. We've supposed to be doing this the whole time. You know, like that kind of thing. It's like, don't, don't be a hero. Don't make other people else look bad to make you look good. Cause you don't know the whole story. You don't know if that's true or not necessarily. Um, sometimes you do, and sometimes it is like, man, why haven't we been doing a better job on this? And that's something to talk to those people about. Try to solve the root problem. Don't throw anybody under the bus. But the next thing is do a good maintenance, right? Do a maintenance that makes a difference to the equipment. If you don't believe in maintenance, it's usually because you're not doing a good maintenance. Thanks for watching. If you're willing, give this video a thumbs up and drop us a comment. Don't forget to hit that bell icon to stay updated with all of our future videos. And as a quick reminder, HVAC School isn't just a YouTube channel. Dive deeper with us at our main website, HVACRschool.com. Curious for more knowledge on the go? We've got you covered. Tune into the HVAC School podcast, available on all your favorite podcast apps. And while you're at it, join our thriving Facebook group. Also, don't miss out on our free mobile applications, available for both iPhone and Android. We're all about community. Vortex by Tex.